Hi, I'm Linda Mel, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Blant Museum of Art and speak with their senior curator of prints, drawings, and European paintings, Dr. Francesca Consagra, about the exhibition In the Company of Cats and Dogs. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm Casey, and I'm here at the Blanton for their In the Company of Cats and Dogs exhibition. And I'm here with Dr. Consagra, who is the senior curator, curator of prints and drawings in European paintings. Thank you for speaking with us. Casey, thank you for coming uh, and talking with me today. My pleasure. So to get us into the exhibition, can you tell us a little bit about how the idea originally came about and how they na narrowed it down to these nine themes that are explored throughout the exhibition? I'd be happy to. Uh, we wanted to do a, you know, interesting summer exhibition that would appeal to everyone, whether you were two or 82. And um, we thought about doing an exhibition on cats and dogs, uh, partially because we have a terrific collection of old master prints and drawings, uh, and some also some wonderful old master paintings, which are highlighted in this exhibition. More than half of the works in the exhibition come, come from the Blanton's collection. So starting with that as the core, uh, I was able to think in terms of themes uh, based on the collection. So we don't cover everything. We, it's, it's really uh, basically a collection-based show. And um, so I started to think of how I could unwind. Uh, you know, we also have 33 centuries of art, so you know, do I lay everything out chronologically? Do I do it thematically? Do and I chose thematically. Uh, and there's a when you first enter, there's a room which is an introductory room, and then uh, which has some of the oldest pieces, but also works from the, the 20th century, uh, as a way of talking about anthropomorphism and how these animals have been with us you know, for millennia. And then it kind of begins to unravel chronologically uh, with primarily, you know, uh, Renaissance and Baroque prints, drawings, and paintings, and wonderful manuscripts um, that we were able to borrow from the Harry Ransom Center uh, here at the University of Texas. It was sort of early European art up through uh, primarily up primarily Renaissance through Baroque. And then there's a small section devoted to mythology, which is also Renaissance and Baroque. And then we're standing now in a small section devoted to hunting before 1700. And then I have hunting really up through to the 20th century. That's followed by literature, which is followed by a room devoted to morality. Uh, with an emphasis on sexuality and how artists have used cats and dogs to lay out ethical or moral questions. Um, a section on abandonment, a section on canine aggression, uh, and then one on domesticity or the cat and dog as the family member. Uh, we also have a wonderful resource room, uh, which was organized by our uh, head of the education department, Ray Williams. Well, fantastic. And so that kind of brings us to this work, which is by Jan Vanix, mm -hmm. and it's called Still Life of Game, and it kind of includes all the different items that are in here. But I thought this was an interesting piece in that it kind of transitions from the classical era as a sacrifice in front of the pedestal, and then it still transitions to the dog as a hunting utilitarian uh, item. So could you kind of explain and expand on that a little bit more? Well, this is a fantastic painting we borrowed from uh, Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And yes, you see the spaniel and you see this pile of game, birds, the hair, you see the net in the background, two falcon caps here, this marvelous orange squirrel uh, that's gnawing on foliage, and then this, this it looks like a pigeon, a type of pigeon coming down and the dog is looking up at the pigeon protecting the game. But when you start looking closely, you see there's a lot of layers to this painting. And uh, when you think of Vanix, who's in 17th century Holland, his kind of art, which is still life, uh, is hierarchically below 
uh, those, the, the, the works of art created, uh, you know, of works of art about mythology or religion. Those artists get the fancy commissions and uh, a lot of prominence. The people who, you know, paint still lifes, a little less so. Uh, and so I see this as, as Vanix saying, I can do a game picture, but layer it with religion and mythological references. So if, uh, if you look, you'll see there's an altar here. It's, it's attached to a building. And there's a classical frieze. Uh, there's also a wonderful classical urn over here. And so we immediately think that this is uh, probably a sacrifice perhaps to Diana. This is a classical landscape. It's certainly not a Dutch landscape because it's not flat. You have hills. Uh, you actually see a man on horseback running here. And then you have some more classical-like statues. Uh, so this is in a mythical landscape, uh, a sacrifice to Diana. But then when, if you were a cultured patron of the arts in 17th century Holland, this would, you'd automatically think of the Annunciation when the dove comes and tells the Virgin Mary that she will be the mother of, of Jesus. Uh, instead, you have it coming down uh, and uh, as sort of life intersect, you know, in, life interjecting itself uh, into this deadly scene. Um, and so with allusions to religious art, allusions to ancient art, I think Phoenix is in a way also sh saying that we painters of game and flowers are, understand the complexity as well of, of creating a great work of art as well as, you know, let's say a Rembrandt yeah, uh, does. They have uh, that same level of worthiness. So here we are in front of Thomas Sully's Cinderella at the Kitchen Fire, and it kind of serves to introduce this larger section of literature. And so it kind of got me wondering, was it important to this exhibition to include a large array of different media? And what did the literature section in particular add to the exhibition as a whole? Well, yes, I did want to have lots of different types of media in the exhibition. Uh, from large fancy pictures like this one uh, to, let's say, a calendar from 1822 or a, a wonderful illustrated book uh, or manuscript. And uh, I, I've, most of my exhibitions, uh, ha I like to play with scale and, and different media. To answer the second part of your question, Casey, which concerns what does this section on literature uh, contribute to the, the whole. And um, it's a section that I pretty much devoted to the cat, uh, since the cat begins to appear uh, at the, you know, in, in the 18th century, more and more as the friend and companion, and less and less as the witch's familiar or the demonic cat of the Middle Ages. Um, and so, I, I wanted there was I wanted some balance because the hunting section is predominantly hunting dogs. I wanted the literature section, which is right next in the gallery adjacent to it, to be really about the cat in literature. That's not to say that dogs aren't, but I I do think the cats provide a lot of whimsy and um, uh, and grace to the illustrated book. With this Gavarni work, it definitely touches on some unique um, interpersonal relationships between an owner and its dog, unlike, you know, the Wegman or the Wyeth, which are kind of a commemoration of a, a dog or a loved pet. This one takes on a whole different uh, issue of complexities. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. I'd, I'd love to. This, is, uh, this was done in eight, around 1840, and it shows uh, quite a plump boy with his plump dog. And then you see in the background, if you look closely, that this child was once quite thin, and so was the dog. And the title of the work is The Dangerous Effects of Oriental Noodles. And you'll see they just open another can, and there's two more waiting. And uh, this boy uh, likes to eat, and he doesn't seem to like to exercise very much. 
and uh, the end result is that the dog uh, starts to look like him. Uh, it's quite plump and uh, is, just, is interested in what's in the can and, and little else. So um, this is what's known by the anthrozoologists or uh, those psychologists that study human-animal interactions as the convergence theory. Your pet ends up looking like you because it's following your lifestyle. Uh, and this, I'd like to talk about a bit about my collaborations with the anthrozoologists uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. They were, worked with me from the very beginning uh, on this topic and were incredibly helpful to understand the, the, the social and biological connections we have with these animals. Really, because it seems like it's such a modern idea, but this is over 150 years old, so. That's, that's right. Well, you know, artists are great observers of life. And uh, in many cases, they're observing this kind of long-term, long-range relationships we've had with these two particular animals. Uh, and they're able to capture it. And we, we've shown that here with 33 centuries of art. We want to thank Dr. Consaga for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to blantonmuseum.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polo.